select board commission. So we'll start with any uh, board information, any information from one of the members of the select board. Is there anything you would like to uh, say, um, Jamie? Thank you. I wanted to thank the Board of Health and um, for putting on another flu clinic today at the Elks, um, I believe DPW, please everybody kind of chipped in some work to make that happen. And those clinics are always so helpful for the community. So appreciate everyone who helped make that happen. Yeah, it was painless and it was seamless. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really, really two seconds in and out. It was yep. really great. Yep. They've had practice. <laughs> and they've had practice before the recent practice. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Al, Jared, do you have anything? Not for me, nope. thank you. Not for me, thanks. Okay. Okay, we'll ha take uh, comments from any of the public that are items on, related to items not on our agenda. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak? There, there's no one. There. Okay. <laughs> We're going to start with a year-end FY22 uh, fiscal presentation. Rich Bienview is going to provide that. And this is something he did for the Finance Committee. Uh, very, very interesting. So let's go ahead, Rich. I'm glad you found it very interesting. Thanks. <laughs> was about an hour and 15 minutes of detailed presentation with some questions. Um, so if you are interested and want some further detail, you can watch the Finance Committee meeting from last week. Or of course, you could always just call me and we can talk it out as well. <coughs> I will try to keep it brief for the tonight's meeting. Uh, I was reminded in watching the news recently of a, a famous saying that says, you don't need to tell people all about the recipe, just give them the brownies. So we are uh, looking at some brownies. And I'll kill this metaphor to death by the end of the presentation. <laughs> uh, start with uh, FY21. This is the budget plan. And the bottom line here that I always like to point out to everybody is we always start with a balanced budget. We have funding sources that fund the amount of appropriations uh, that we're asking town meeting to raise. Uh, so we have our operating budget, our capital budget. And other items, th this year other items was the family support package and uh, funding of the uh, water enterprise shortfall. Back in FY21, and as you recall, 22, it was self-supporting. <clears throat> and so spend a little bit of time of how did this play out? Where did we end up? And so this is the cutting to the chase. This is where we're ending up. Um, the end result of operating activity any year is, is a generation of or of a generation of surplus or incurring of a deficit, uh, we have surplus, and that surplus gets added to our general fund, undesignated fund balance. And at the June 30th, 2021, our general fund, undesignated fund balance is anticipated to be about $4.35 million. That's this number here, which represents about just under 14% of our, <coughs> our budget. And of course, we also have a stabilization fund, which is coming in at 1470 which is just under 5% of our budget for that year. So a total of $5.8 million, 18.5% uh, of our budget in total reserves. Um, those results will generate, and this is an estimate, um, I always go put myself out on a limb. A lot of people don't like to do this. Um, so if it changes, it'll change, and I'll let you know. Uh, but we're anticipating just under $3.9 million of free cash as a, res as a result of that, which is a huge amount for the town of East Ham. So it's just over 12% of our budget. But there's some very good reasons as to why that has happened. And so we're going to go through um, a couple of the brownies uh, and talk about the ingredients that, you know, resulting in the brownies. Uh, but I want to give you all, uh, anyone listening, uh, take a little bit of pause. It is a great position, definitely, to be in. But keep in mind that we're apt to spend a good portion of that free cash on things that we want or need. And so by the time we're done spending that free cash, um, we will no longer have that in our unreserved fund balance. And so uh, we're working on, Jackie and I are working on our budget for FY23. And when Jackie presents her budget to you, uh, that will include utilization of free cash and some recommendations associated with that. And I would expect, um, just ballpark, um, that our general fund fund balance after we utilize free cash will be less than 5%. And it will bring our 
total stabilization in general fund to be less than 10 percent. So um, we are at our target now, but only if we don't use, you know, only if we don't spend all the money. How did we, how does that compare to usual? This slide shows a history of free cash. And we always got to keep in mind that we, uh, just because we certified free cash doesn't mean that's how much was generated in any given year, because we always carry forward and uh, don't spend all of our free cash, which is a solid practice for us because we don't have a lot of reserves otherwise. And so this year we're anticipating about 3.9 million, but 3.2 is, uh, is what was generated in the year because the, prior, the about 700,000 was carried forward unspent from the prior year. And if you go over time, you see that's pretty consistent. That being said, 3.2 million is the highest amount we've had in uh, 11 years in, for the town of East Ham. Why do we get that? Uh, this chart kind of summarizes that all. Uh, the key drivers are uh, local receipts generated about $2.2 million of free cash, savings on budgeted appropriations about 908000 and continued good collections from our tax collector, uh, basically getting close to 100% of collections and the excess here representing collections on prior year tax liens and that's why we have a surplus there. And before I go any further, I, I usually say this right up front, I don't want to miss saying this. Um, it's easy for me to present the results and summarize this and talk to you about all this, uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into this, so I just want to make sure I thank uh, Susan Lack, our town treasurer and collector, and particularly our accounting office, Tina, Tilton, and Cassidy, uh, Weeks, uh, uh, accounting team, have to file all these reports with the Department of Revenue and the Department of Revenue will certify our free cash and accept our uh, end-of-the-year financial statements. Uh, there's a whole process that needs to be gone through, and uh, they see us through all that process. So we're on track on that, and they're, you know, they're all doing a good job uh, to make that happen. Here you can also see, in addition to the additions to the free cash for the year, here's that almost 700000 that we didn't utilize last year. We dropped that because uh, we're adding more to our stabilization fund. Uh, so, but I wouldn't anticipate that this level is about where we need to keep it um, going forward. And um, ev every year goes by, we kind of reevaluate that. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is how we ended up with, uh, as you can see, the tax liens on prior year collections is where we generated the $100,000 savings on property taxes. Our state aid doesn't contribute much or anything, it's budgeted pretty close to what we anticipate to get. But this is where the real action is. This is our local receipts. Uh, and I told you in that first slide that $2.2 million came from our local receipts. It's down here. Uh, that's on a budget of just over $3 million. And we actually collected $5.2 million. Uh, why such the disparity? Well, obviously, the second line item here, the short-term rentals, um, holding true to our promise of uh, not utilizing that for the operating budget, preserving it for capital and reserves, it is not budgeted, it is not part of the operating budget. So all of that, a tremendous year of $937,000, goes directly to our bottom line. And so these are the funds that, um, until such time as you direct us to use it, like you did in FY22 for um, housing coordinator, a uh, small amount of it, uh, that amount will continue to get added to free cash each year and uh, incumbent on Jackie and I to make sure that when we provide you with budget recommendations that we spend it in accordance with your policy wishes. Um, motor vehicle excise continues to be strong. Um, it's always a concern. Uh, it's a very cyclical in nature and has a, a tendency to go down in a down economy 10% uh, easily and as much as 20%. So we always want to be conservative with how much we budget for motor vehicle excise, but we continue to have pretty good results there. Solid waste fees uh, continue to be delivering good amount of uh, surplus, but the thing to keep in mind there, we're generating a good amount of revenue, but it is also uh, correspondingly have an increasing amount of expense associated with the tipping fees and the hauling fee, uh, transportation fees to haul that off Cape. So although we have good results, we also have increased expenses. And also, um, one of the things uh, DPW Director Silvio Genoa and I have to talk about is uh, the contract that expires, I think it's 2024-25, uh, 
we're expecting that those fees will have to increase. And so we've got to set ourselves up to be able to handle that in a couple of years. Uh, the other good result, which is an obvious one, is that down here under beat stickers and fees. Uh, we budgeted 265000 It had, I think, the best performing year, at least in memory, of $627,000, um, generating 361000 towards our free cash. Rich, do we, do we have any idea why? I mean, I mean, obviously more people use the beach, but yeah, that's a big jump. Yeah, that was a discussion on uh, yeah, finance committee. It's basically it was all around. Yeah. I got the breakout from Christine. It did not go into the packet, but I'll get it to you next time. But it goes through, you know, we were, we did day passes when other towns didn't. We mm -hmm. did an increase in weekly stickers, two-week stickers, seasonal stickers, all across the board. That's great. So a couple of things that I just want to point out here because um, as we get into our budget discussion in the next several months, uh, it'll be coming up again uh, because you have a budget policy and the financial management policies you adopted that we want to use, which is a uh, conservative practice, 80% of, of our actual local receipts to fund the next year's budget. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because if you used 100% of your prior year actual receipts to fund your next year's budget and things take a turn for the worse, you're going to be playing catch up to try to figure out what you need to cut or what else can you do to make up that shortfall. So an economic downturn generally hits local re uh, receipts anywhere between 10 and 20%. So if you're budgeting at 80%, you'd be able to survive a downturn without having to make too many, many cuts. So right now, um, our receipts are actually 173% uh, of budget. So 5.2 million is 73% more than 3 million. But that includes the short-term rentals. So if we don't include those, we're 42% over. And if you are concerned about the solid waste issue, and we want to make sure we're setting something aside for that and exclude uh, solid waste savings, uh, we're 139 percent, so a good position to be in. So uh, all things being equal, as we move forward, I would expect the local receipts contribution to our budget in this upcoming year will go up because we've demonstrated that we've been able to uh, do so by having a couple of good years of activity. This slide shows where we generated savings from our operating budgets. And so the takeaway here is, uh, although 908000 seems like a lot of money on a 30-plus um, million dollar budget, it's 3% savings. And there's good reason for most of them, the big ones, um, police and fire salaries typically generate sal uh, savings if you don't have, for example, uh, large-scale events that require overtime or line-of-duty injuries that require overtime to fill in shifts. And we've been very lucky the last couple of years in that regard and last year in this regard. And so most of the savings you see here on fire and police are unused overtime because we've had good luck, basically. But we need to provide for it in case we don't have good luck. Uh, also, that service is generating a good amount of money. Um, that's because of the timing of debt service associated with the water project. Uh, the Mass Clean Water uh, Trust, SRF program. Uh, it's not easy to pinpoint exactly when they're going to do their work or authorize their bonds or make an interim bond, a final bond. Uh, so we had to provide for one of our interim bonds going final. As it turns out, it didn't become final and require a debt service payment in FY21. And so we didn't have to pay it, and that's generating the savings. Uh, however, since that is with exempt debt, uh, we can't return this to our fund balance. We have to carry this over to the next year, uh, and we will because that bond is now final and will require payment in FY22, and this is how we'll fund that payment. Um, bottom line here is you don't see too many areas where you're generating a lot of surplus over half the budget, all other appropriations down here on the bottom, or about half the budget, only generates about $200,000 of savings. 
which tells me that we're budgeted pretty tight on an operating basis, um, which is great. Uh, our, we have a lot of faith in our department heads, department heads to spend the money wisely and appropriately, and um, I think that goes towards um, being successful at town meeting and, and asking my people for uh, our, the budgets that we do. When you back out that debt service timing issue, instead of 3%, our savings on our budget is about 2.5%. Um, so that's not a lot of excess given the size of the budget. This is the same thing, just look, a different look. You know, this top half shows top salary savings. Um, and the thing on the salaries is generally we do budget for 100% of what we expect to happen, except for the overtime. Um, but you have opportunities to have savings when there is employee turnover, and maybe you don't fill a position uh, right away. And that's the, the case here on the $6.5 million of all other. Only 44000 was saved by uh, unfilled positions and timing associated with you know, employee transitions, which tells me that we're, we're budgeting our salaries right on, which is kind of how we want to do it. Um, we ha maintain a, a position control system to make sure that we don't overfill positions and take things on that aren't budgeted or provided for. So, And then this is the non-salary accounts down below. And this is more on the uh, purview of the Finance Committee, you know, not that the select board isn't interested, but um, we're getting a little bit into the details now and a lot of the uh, ingredients as opposed to the brownies. Um, but it is useful to know the debt level that we're taking on uh, with our water project and with things that we might be considering in the future. You can see that our outstanding debt here has climbed from 64 million about four years ago up to about 91 million. And we expected that because of the water project being in process. Um, and you can see, likewise, because of that, the amount of debt that's been authorized and voted by town meeting has dropped from $76 million to only $31 million now. So we kind of know what the light at the end of the tunnel looks like because we know what we've got on hand and we know what's left to go at this point in time. And then down here represents what the annual budget needs to reflect to fund that. So right now we're just under $4.6 million of annual debt service, uh, which puts us about 14% of budget, um, which is a little high um, from a ratings perspective. Um, but it really only matters to the extent our community has an issue uh, paying for it. And, um, of course, any one circumstance could have an issue with paying for something, so I don't mean it that way. Um, but when you look at our ta overall tax burden compared to other communities and compared to commu communities across Massachusetts, we continue to be in the bottom third of, tax, of pro single family property tax burden in the state. And so although we have a relatively high level of debt given the size of our town and our budget, um, hasn't severely impacted our tax burden at this point. Uh, I put this on here mostly for the Finance Committee because we've been talking about how do we manage our pension and OPEB obligations. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but there's a lot of technical information regarding our obligations for our pension, which is about $20 million currently, and we're on a funding schedule uh, mandated by law that by the year 2038 that that needs to be fully funded. And um, the only thing I guess I would add to that is it used to be 2033 and then the pension systems realized they didn't have great <laughs> returns and they got the legislature to extend that to 2038. And so I guess that's how politics goes sometimes. But uh, Not of a particular concern, but uh, obviously to note, uh, the town does have a other post-employment benefit liability. This is um, the amount that we actually determined every other year a value to pay for health insurance costs of our retirees. And you can see as health costs increase across the country, our, ins our insurance costs also increase, and you see that that liability has increased from 29 to $39 million in just a matter of, uh, you know, four, three to four years. Uh, why I say I have no particular concern, uh, not that it's not a concern, but we're not unique in that most communities 
almost all communities in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact, have not fully funded this and have taken some efforts to fund it, such, just as East Ham has. Uh, but it's a matter of priorities. We certainly could fund this if that was the direction the town wanted to take. But when you're faced with this liability that is going to be paid out over the next 30 plus years versus doing something that's more immediate, where do you want to put your resources? And so that's the contemplation that uh, policy making boards have to make all the time. If we have opportunities to address OPEB, then um, it's part of my job to make sure that I let everybody know that and uh, take advantage of those opportunities when we can. And then I'll end it here, unless somebody, um, well, I won't quite be ending, but just about end. Uh, how does all this shape up to um, our goal of trying to get a AAA bond rating? Um, these are the factors that go into a bond rating. Uh, the top two we can't control, the bottom uh, five we can. Uh, we're very strong, which is the highest rating in two of them. And we have room for improvement in three of them. With the adoption of the financial management policies and some of the projections that we've done, I'm very hopeful that our management score, which is the biggest controllable factor, will become a very strong. And I think that alone should get us to a AAA. If it's not, our budgetary performance the last couple of years has been very strong and we've demonstrated the ability to build reserves and maintain the reserves. And so that should go from adequate to at least strong, if not very strong. Uh, in debt, um, we don't need to go on my <laughs> diatribe about uh, how I feel about debt with S&P uh, other than to say that I don't think it should be very weak and I gotta come figure out a way to communicate that to them that in a way that they'll understand that. And uh, in any event, uh, I think we will make improvement in each of these five, or three of the five controllable areas, which will get us to a AAA, um, but that we'll see. And then for informational only, um, every year I like to update where all the towns on the Cape stand with regard to various matters. And uh, these last few slides kind of show that. And there's a lot, in any one of these slides really, we could spend a lot of time talking about and if you have anybody has a particular interest, and this goes uh, not only for the SUC board and the Finance Committee, but anyone in, the, in our community that wants to talk about any of this stuff, I'm always available to uh, have a great discussion about municipal finance and on any of these issues. And with that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't have a question, but thank you very much for this thorough overview. It showed the full picture, so I appreciate that. Um, one thing that I did kind of want to mention, just because I, I feel like I've had this conversation from a business standpoint about, you know, a couple of good years of activity, you had said. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of folks have seen a couple, well, some folks have seen some really bad years, some some places that have a lot of outdoor recreational activity, Recreational activity areas have seen a couple of really good years. Um, so I think that, I have to take this off while I talk. Um, I think that it's something to bear in mind that that level of income for the town might be tenuous, you know, something to think about, you know, that, you know, where we're at now. As I'm sure, you know, Rich, you know, it, it can change very quickly. So. Yeah, I guess what I would say to that, and that's a great point which is why we have these financial management policies with the baseline being 80% of our actual collections being used in our prior year budget. Mm. Not that we can't do more, we could do 85%, but if, if we do recommend that, then Jackie and I need to communicate that to you. And if we theoretically go over 90%, which we could also do, that you, know, you could vote to adopt, we wanna start documenting the reasons and, yeah. and how we get out of that. So as we ratchet up to less conservative budgeting techniques to more aggressive, we want to make sure we have things in place to address exactly what you're that talking about. Yeah. The $3.9 million of free cash is a lot of money, but, but yeah. it's a one-time occurrence. Yeah. And so we do not fund within our operating budget, which consists of recurring expenses. We don't fund that with non-recurring revenues. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for saying that. Maybe. Uh, yeah, just a quick question about the short-term rental tax. So that was with the 4%, correct? Yes. Wow. Yes, I meant to say that. The 6, right? So it could be 50% higher next year. 
Oh, maybe 30%. 33%, right? 33.333. From four to six? <laughs> Don't make me do math oh. on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> two is a third of six, but two is half of four. So you're, aren't you increasing? Your it point budget? is well taken. It's okay. a lot more money. <laughs> yes. Well, I and think we had told. Just check it. Spending that three million already. <laughs> <laughs> I think when four we were, were discussing half. this at town meeting, <laughs> our short-term receipts were in the five fifty six hundred thousand range, and we were talking. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you're right. So fifty percent. We were saying three hundred thousand on about a six hundred thousand short-term rental. And in fact, it turned out with a very banner year to be yeah. just under a million bucks. Yeah, wow. But I do you mind if I just say no, please? But I think this also is still tied to that idea of this. You know, we've had a good couple years of activity. That applies to rentals and, yep. you know, people traveling and spending money like they are too. So again, like that idea of, you know, having things in place to protect that back end yep. should it follow. Yeah, and we've also had an increase in full-time residents. Yeah, and so I mean. Some of those rentals may no longer be rentals and generate that income. I mean, yep. we don't know. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's the thing, yeah. It's, it's been such a funny couple of years that we just don't know. It's a good position to be in this year, but yeah. Uh, Al, Jared, do you have anything? Questions? No, no questions. Thank you, Rich and team, for making that data so easy to see and understand. Yeah, it looks good. You're welcome. I, I, you know, this is, as I said at the finance meeting, this is a fantastic finance job. I mean, it, we're in really, really good shape. And I think we're at a position where when you guys come back with a budget, we can strategize what, how, if any, of this money we use going to projects we've actually decided are the things we want to do. Yeah. Um, so I think we're in a great position. Yeah, actually, I was going to comment on that just to put a cap on it, put some whipped cream on these brownies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, and Jackie, I haven't gone too far down the budget path yet. Um, in the conversations we have, I think what you could expect is you've exp clearly expressed to us some of your priorities. And so um, this free cash, uh, a good portion of it will be going to, I would consider it like seed funding of various programs that uh, don't commit us in the long run to recurring expenditures over time, but certainly can start some things off. And if they are if we continue to have good performance in future years, we could continue to fund or scale back as the need, uh, as the case arises, right? So that's probably how we're gonna be approaching our budget process. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Good, okay, thank you very thank much, you. Rich. Uh, ready to move on to select board goals? You got the floor. I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> So um, after our last discussion where we reviewed last year's goals, basically I took, <clears throat> bas using the framework of the strategic plan again, I took some of the goals that I know that we've been talking about and you guys have expressed and just sort of put them in the framework of the strategic plan, uh, focusing on, of course, um, the, the big projects of your new housing goals, economic and parcel development of Tea Time Town Center and the COA site, um, infrastructure improvements to Route 6 and using the Complete Streets program, and moving forward with uh, wastewater draft plans. So those are the big general categories. So those are the big four. The big four. What we're going to try and do is have a six-year plan for activity within all of those big four. Jamie? Um, one thing we had that you had done a great presentation on, too, was the business support programs. Mm -hmm. Are those in here? No, but if, if we had to place them, we'd put them under economic housing and parcel development That's with T-Time Town Center. Okay, great. Okay. So you want to, actually we'll make it two. Yeah, I think it should, it should be 
listed because I think that you're going to be working on it anyway, and I think it ties into everything yeah. that's listed here. What are, what are we calling those business resiliency, business recovery and resiliency programs, programs. I think? I should look at the old agenda to see what it was called. I think it's recovery and resiliency. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I think this is great. Thank you. I forgot that one. Everybody else okay with it? Yeah, looks great. Since I can't see you, Alan, Jared, you okay with it? Yep, everything I want is on there. Oh, good. Yep. Okay, so wow, we, Jared. <laughs> would you like us to vote on this, or? Yeah, what? sure. If you if you feel comfortable, I'll add the under economic housing parcel development for Tea Time Town Center and COA. I'm going to add uh, the business support slash recovery and resiliency program right. implementation. Okay, so I'll make I'll make a motion to approve the draft goals. With those changes. With those changes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, sorry, yeah, I had one thing to add too. I realized um, if <clears throat> we're getting all specific here with the housing part, um, we also need to come up with the ideas for um, what to do with that two percent tax that was added on mm -hmm. for after that was discussed at town meeting. Mm -hmm. That's that's probably implied there anyway in the housing bit, but I just wanted to make that very clear. Yeah, I think you can set a goal for that. So we'll start collecting that next year. So you'll see, just like we have an amount for you this year, at the end of next fiscal year, you'll get that amount set aside. So we'll start to have it to spend a year from now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think what we should do is take the time to figure out, you know, how that fits into the how that fits into your goals and what specifically you want to use that money for. And I'll put that as the goal, right? How to allocate I the... Okay, we ready to vote? I think so. Al? Aye. Jared? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Amy? Aye. And Art is an aye. That's great, thank you. Committee resignations. We have a uh, resignation on the Council of Aging Board of Directors by of Richard Ramon. So we got the resignation letter and we're all set to go. We're all set to go. I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Richard Ramon from the Council on Aging. Uh, he's served since 2015, so thank you very much. Six years. Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, let's vote. Al? Aye. Jared? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Amy? Aye. And I am an aye. All right. Um, then we have two committee appointments. Bill O'Shea to the Council on Aging Board of Directors and Sheldon Ross on the search committee. I'll make a motion to appoint Bill O'Shea to the Council on Aging and Sheldon Ross to the search committee. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I did have one thing that um, I thought was pretty great. Um, on Sheldon Ross's application, they were saying that <clears throat> he's a new full-time resident who um, was active in the community he's coming from and looking to get involved. And I thought, you know, the search committee is such a great place to start for someone who's new to full-time residency because it gives you such a broad overview of the functioning of the town. It has great organizational skills, and it's such a good foundation to, like, move from, from there. So I thought that was a really great match. Yeah, he is. Uh, I, I, I participated in the interview for him. Mm -hmm. And um, his initial interest was the library, board of directors, and he's got experience in that area. Um, but, yeah, we said, this, you know, we told him there's a lot of other committees, so uh, yeah. hopefully we can see him on some more. Yeah, what a great spot to begin. Cool. Okay, let's vote. Al? Aye. Jared? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Amy? Aye. And I am an aye. All right. Transient vendor permit. I'll make a motion to approve the transient vendor permit for Aaron Young. Second. Any discussion? All right. The vote, Al? Aye. Jared? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Amy? 
Aye. And also, I am an aye. Okay. You're on. Oh, it's me again. Town Administrator Report. Um, so I focused my update this week on capital projects because I haven't done that with you guys for a while. So um, we'll put this up. It's in the packet if anyone's interested in the specifics. But uh, high points are that we are now out to bid for the Rock Harbor Building and Site Improvement Project. We did receive the funding from the Seaport Economic Council and sub bids are due this week and general bids November 1st. So we're hoping that we get some good interest in that project. Um, water's going terrific as, as usual. We're just Swimmingly. now, we're used to it. Yeah, we're used to the water project going so smoothly. But the team is here tonight, so that's good. Well, thank you. It's sparkling. Oh, Rich. He's going from brownies to water now. <laughs> Um, but basically, uh, I think exciting that we have hopefully a total of 1,700 customers coming with 1,531 hooked up and 176 pending. So 39% connection rate, which isn't bad at all. We're very happy. Um, we hope to have the draft target watershed management plan for you guys sometime late this fall we're still sort of we just got a recent draft we're digesting and um, probably bringing that towards maybe between thanksgiving and christmas for a first pass um, and tea time master planning rfp will go out to bid later this month. I think we're like a week away from sending that out. So still on schedule with that for the first of the year. Um, the Nauset School building project is, is moving along um, on schedule. Um, so that's good. Um, and I explained the emergency dredge a little more in this too, if anyone has any questions on that. Um, and basically, my other updates were around the flu clinic and COVID, so nothing huge. But I did get something from the National Seashore today, letting us know that the Nauset bike trail between Salt Pond Visitor Center and Doan Picnic Area will be closed for safety repairs beginning October 18th. Um, they've had a lot of frost heaves from last winter and it's causing some issues so they're going to go ahead and fix those um, so it's about 350 feet of trail it's torn up right now yeah they don't right. say how much time they're going to take to do it but yeah it was in bad shape it was it's closed teeth chattering <laughs> yeah we're getting a, a lot of comments on the Nauset light uh, website because the uh, repair is going so quickly. We're about 25, 30% uh -huh. done and should finish up very soon. And they're saying, well, how come those guys can't do the bathrooms? I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we said, no, it's a different company. I know. I so know. It's, it's interesting. It's okay. terrible. Um, do, we, do you have any idea or any preconceived notion of um, people that are going to bid on that planner, that planning assignment? I mean, I, I mean, in your mind, you know, there's three or four firms that you're hoping are going to put in a bid because they're really good? Or yeah, we have some firms that we identified during the um, process of the community, community planning group within the Tea Time group. Um, met with quite a few of consultants that have done other projects, and so we have a list of those. Um, but there are quite a few firms who do it in New England. There's a lot of interest in uh, Main Street revitalization in the New England area, so there are a lot of firms that do this type of work. So we're hoping um, to attract a good one. Okay. I think that's going to be very competitive. Good. So. Okay. okay, move on to um, uh, minutes approvals. We have uh, approvals of the minutes for the regular session on Monday, October 4th, and the executive session on Monday, October 4th. I, uh, I didn't see them in the, on the uh -oh. OneDrive. Did anybody else? I looked under minutes and it only had the ones. Yeah, I looked right before the meeting again and they weren't. 
they weren't there. Okay, we'll move that off. Okay. okay. Okay, good. I w it wasn't just me missing them. So we'll postpone that to our next meeting. Yeah. Yeah, they were supposed to be October 4th. No. Okay, any um, any new or upcoming agenda items or follow-up on previous items? Art. Al? Yeah, I'd like to uh, dive into that uh, uh, community store, uh, trades and storage. Uh, see what the, what's going on with that. I believe we spoke about it earlier this week for a future agenda item. Oh, um, we explored that pretty thoroughly last winter and came, kind of came to a dead end with it, uh, basically in my understanding for two reasons. One was we it is basically storage is not allowed in any zoning district other than the commercial industrial which is off of Holmes Road, right? So we actually have a current application pending or it was just denied by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Is it Zoning Board of Appeals or Planning Board? For the storage at Willie's. Zoning. Z zoning. So you know, we have one of our boards saying it is not allowed in that to that uh, zone that contributes to our water system. And the only place that we had to do storage was at the tank, which is actually in the water protection overlay district. So I felt like we really couldn't go too far in that direction without figuring out something else. And we don't really want to do make infrastructure there to protect the groundwater so it kind of came to a crashing end the other piece was al only one person came forward that wanted the storage and they wanted such a huge piece it wasn't a normal storage section it was quite quite a lot of land so we just you know the, the idea of fencing it off keeping it so so that's, it kind of stopped last winter sometime, but I mean, we can try and revive it, but I don't know quite where to put it. Because we, we don't own any land off Holmes Road except no. for Village at Nossa Green. I, th right. I, I seem to recall that uh, there was a discussion, um, there, well, there's a couple of things, um, actually, is uh, I'm, I'm interested in the, the outreach there, uh, what that looked like. Um, curious, and then the other thing is, is uh, um, wasn't there discussion about uh, at the town shed as well, or land over that way, or the uh, in the dump area? Yes, there was, and then we just didn't we didn't think there was enough space there that was in a place where people could come and access what they needed after hours, so. We didn't feel comfortable with that site, so we moved it to the tank site, which has a lot more land, but it's even closer to right, right, the water right. system. Hmm. Al, are you getting a lot of uh, questions from various fishermen that are looking for that sp space? Yeah, uh, about uh, uh, 10 or 15 or so um, stakeholders in town here had approached me about it. That's why I was just curious about the, the outreach and um what was going on with that and then uh, and just as of recently as well um and as far as the zoning is concerned i'm i'm curious so and i, I guess this is, would be a question for the, the zba but uh you can store this stuff in your yard but you, you can't store it in uh the, the i'm trying to understand the the other than homes road other, other than private property you're saying it's not well, it's not necessarily private property. It's that that is our zone of zoning that is designated for commercial industrial. Um, and the, you know, storing it in your yard is a by right, you know, kind of heritage issue that we have for people who have home businesses. So I, I agree it could not protect the groundwater either, but. Uh, it's not, if your home isn't in our, 
water overlay protection district, then it's it's really not something that we're going to be terrifically concerned about. Uh, just to clarify, yeah. the zoning board rejected Willie's proposal to create additional storage units on their property, and they were saying that it was an extension of a current use because they already have a storage uh, storage facility. Pre-existing. Yeah. The that, zoning, that was the applicant's case, yeah. Yeah, though that's the one I was, that's the storage, wasn't that the storage one you were talking about? Yes. Okay. And um, they rejected that, and the, it was a, it was rejected by one vote. Mm -hmm. And that individual that voted no, voted no because he said they were concerned about what they were gonna put in the storage units and the fact that it could harm the groundwater. And that was really the reason for rejection. And I understand from a zoning standpoint, you know, there are other issues, but, so I just wanted to clarify that. And, and, and I'm not wondering, uh, uh, much like uh, conservation restrictions and orders of conditions, if uh, if groundwater is in fact an issue, um, I'm sure there's um, equipment such as lobster traps, for instance, but not limited to that wouldn't uh, may or may not influence the groundwater quality. I'm I'm just uh, I'm trying to figure, uh, you know. Do some due diligence on this, you know, not just uh, in, in my, for myself, otherwise, you know, I don't know. And I think, Al, that's certainly the case that that property owner made to the ZBA, but you understand that the town is in a position where we defend our, we, we need to defend our own zoning. So we can't be in a situation where we are saying no to a business owner who wants to do this type of thing and then we go ahead and set up our own competing enterprise somewhere else in town. See what I'm saying? No, I, I, no, I, I completely understand that. Even, if it's, understand a, even that. if it's a temporary storage area? Well, what's temporary about yeah, this, Al? Yeah. I mean, well, our <laughs> I thought this was these guys were going to be storing it in the winter only. Right, but they want to do yeah. it every winter forever. Yeah. Yeah, we did allow Seasonal. we did allow storage on tea time uh, when they were doing telephone poles. Yeah, but that was a yeah. time limited contract. That's different than a recurring storage. I mean, we can look into it again, and I would encourage Al if someone uh, is approaching you or asking you about it, have them either call me or Silvio or Rich. I mean, Rich and Silvio worked on it for a long time last winter and um, it just didn't come to any satisfactory <laughs> conclusion that we could that we could figure out but if if you honestly if there are that many people that want it then um, have them you know have them either shoot an email to me or Silvio or Rich and and we'll try and get on it again and see if there isn't some way we can figure it out yeah, absolutely. And I remember the discussion was also, you know, uh, we were all, all seemed to be in favor of it on the board here, um, from my, my, from what my memory serves, um, that, uh, it would, it would exponentially help with the potential for, you know, issues of blight as it were, you know, um, I don't know, does everybody on the board still feel as if this is a, uh, you, something useful for the community? Just curious. Yes. Jamie? So I would say that in theory, yes, right? Um, any community service you can provide is going to be useful um, to residents. But at the same time, I also understand that we can't say no to one party but allow a municipality to do that exact same thing. So you know, there's a lot of things that I want to do in this town, and there are a lot of things I can't do because of restrictions, because of regulations, because morally I shouldn't do it. I don't know. There's different reasons why you can and can't do certain things. So, yes, I mean, I would love to see this happen if it's feasible, but if it becomes restrictive and prohibitive and we're spending time on something that's not going to 
have the impact we're looking, I'd rather see everybody in town working on something that would have an impact. The, the other thing, I mean, I haven't thought about this in a while, but the other thing we could try and do is offer some incentive or some way to help people use their yards in better ways to do storage or yeah. containers in their yard. I don't know. Well, we had know. talked about doing even a, um, amnesty day mm -hmm. with that something just to help with, you know. Junk and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But if you're storing I don't know things if that, that, that you really, need to keep. Yeah, I mean, one of this. the issues that I thought we could deal with under this, I thought it was a great idea. And one of the issues that I wanted to use it for was we have several landscapers who keep a lot of equipment in their yard mm -hmm. and their neighbors complain. and. Um, but again, that makes it worse because then you have gasoline or engines or yeah. trailers or things. So, um, so it's just it it's just it is a great idea. It's just it was more complicated than we foresaw last year, and so we stopped working on it at sometime in the winter, early spring, and and we can take a second look at it. But I really would be interested, and it is important to know who wants it and what they want it for because what they want it for is is the critical um, piece that we need to know. So is there a way to kind of maybe Al have some of those folks come forward so that we can get a better understanding and then once we have that it would make it easier to see if you can create a program around the needs. Yeah. So that you have a little more of a target of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah I think that would help out a lot. Sure. Just have them email me. Will do. Well, I, you know, I think if we, I think if we can accommodate this, it would be great. So I think we should continue working on it. Um, and if we can't, we can't. But um, if we, if there is a, a, a lot of people out there that want it, then I think we ought to put the time in to see if there's something we can't do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that defining exactly what needs we're looking that are looking to be met will help so that you can yeah. design a program that does that because otherwise yeah, what's the point? Who we polled were all the shell fishermen and aquaculture grant holders that we know. Yeah. So that are listed and that we have. That's what we did. So mm -hmm. no beyond that. Okay. Any other follow up and item? I'm my, sorry. Just so I'm just so I'm clear on the uh, on the, the polling process. Um, uh, out of the X amount of aquaculturalists, only one aquaculturist uh, um, came forward and they wanted uh, an unreasonable amount of space for the equipment. Is that what I'm, what I'm understanding? Yeah, I think we had three to start with. And then when, you know, we started delving into how much space they wanted and what they wanted, kind of two dropped off and one remained and it was, uh, too much space for us to accommodate. It's not unreasonable. It's just that um, I think what what that person was saying is that he had places, he had storage in three different areas and he was trying to consolidate it into one, which would make it easier for him. And I get that, but um, it, was a, it was a big wow. area. Interesting. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other um, follow-up items or potential agenda items for the future? Um, I had one. Uh, yes, Jerry? Um, I was uh, just chatting too about this, uh, about maybe seeing if Center for Coastal Studies would like to come back for another update on how mm -hmm. the studies are going in the estuary. The I keep seeing them out there. Yep. And the, they yeah, they've are... been posting and they've been finding some kind of cool stuff. Yeah, neat. Yep. So I, I would love an update, especially after going through a, you know, a season. Well, I know they wrapped up their two of the bigger studies, mm -hmm. so so I think it's a great time to do it. Cool, do a check in. Great. <laughs> okay, is there any other business correspondence, business or correspondence? <coughs> All right. Um, now, do I need to do we need no. to do a vote to adjourn to make a motion? Yes. Right. So okay. I would like a motion for the select board to adjourn. Uh, our select board meeting, uh, and then we will start a uh, board of water commissioner meeting and not to return to the select board meeting. That wasn't very good, was it? It works. I'll make yeah. a mo. Oh, okay. No, you could do it. You do better. 
<laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I make a motion that we adjourn as the Board of Selectmen and reconvene as the Board of Water, Water Commissioners not to return to regular Board of Selectmen session. You can't do that from now on. That's great. I'll second that motion. <laughs> it's just All right, experience. any discussion? Okay, we'll vote. Al. Aye. Jared. Aye. Jamie. Aye. Amy. Aye. I am an aye. Okay. So now. Now who's the chair of the board? I think of Al is, isn't he? I'm sorry? Isn't Al the chair of the water commissioners? I don't know. Yeah. Are you the chair? Am I still Al? that? Am yes, I you still are. The chair of the water board. Take it out. Take it away, Al. Here is Al. <laughs> hold on. Please hold. I didn't even know I was on the board. <laughs> See, that's how you're there. I know. I'm trying to pull up this whole mountain. Please hold. Your meeting is important to us. <laughs> oh. Would you like me to handle the first item, which is request to increase the number of curb stops at Bracket Landing? Yeah, go ahead, do that. Okay. <laughs> Great. Why well, is the only item? Well, it's the only oh, item. I got it here. It's the only <laughs> item, so we're all set. All right, Board of Water Commissioners, here we go. So, so basically, um, you all have a request from our. Uh, Environmental Partners Group, our in engineers, uh, we have all met with, uh, and here in the audience, here in the audience, here in the public tonight, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> is Wes Stinson from EPG with Jackie Tupper from EPG, our water clerk, King, Kim St. Aubin, and um, their fearless leader, Silvio Janelle. And basically, everyone has sort of touched this and met with um, the representatives of Dory Lane and we all agree that this was an issue that sort of preceded our regulations um, and that it's sort of an unfair hardship on the Dory Lane neighborhood to only have a very limited amount of curb stops and so we are recommending that you um, give Dory Lane a waiver so that we can exempt the regulations, step out of the regulations, and give them an adequate number of curb stops. Would you like to? Would you like to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. No, but we do have a letter of recommendation from. Jackie, do, do any of you want to clarify anything or? They just want to make sure that everyone can get the curb stop where. Yeah. There you go, sure. Wes. Could you? <laughs> yeah, because they only have. So just, just to give the uh, board a brief clarification of the reasoning behind this request is typically per our regulations, we provide one curb stop per parcel, um, which in the case of Dory Lane, as Jackie Beebe said, is somewhat of a hardship given that they are condo associations with four to five units per, per parcel, um, which is not typical of a parcel in East Ham. So as we go through the Dory Lane neighborhood uh, along the right of way where we have an easement for our utility, we're passing not only conjoined condo units, but also you know separated units um, with road frontage on the parcel and we can only really give, per the regulation, one curb stop to each of those units. Um, and from a best practices water work standpoint, it does actually make more sense in this situation to install multiple curb stops to allow for a more you know, pragmatic and efficient uh, connection for the Dory Lane residents. Uh, with that said, we're not looking to do necessarily, you know, there's 49, I believe, units with 48, uh, 48 units within Dory Lane. We're not necessarily going to go from the 10 curb stops that we allotted to 48. We're going to look at it um, from an engineering standpoint and see how many they necessarily do need. Uh, you know, some parcels will go from one to two or one to three, and you know, from there move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. it, well, it, does anybody have any questions from the board? 
Um, I don't think so. No, I think when you explain it that way, that's helpful. Jeff? Yeah, it basically gives our engineering division. I love to call you a division now. I like that the, <laughs> the ability to do what makes, makes sense yeah. for the residents and for the system on an engineering basis <laughs> rather than on our regulations. All right, sounds good. We'll take a vote. Yeah, I make a motion that we approve the increased curb stops for Drury Lane. Second. Uh, uh, roll call vote. Art. Aye. Amy. Aye. Jamie. Aye. Jared. Aye. <laughs> and I'm an I as well. All right, what else we got here? You need to get an ad get a motion to adjourn the Water Commission <laughs> meeting. I make a, I'm, nice. I'm sorry, one question. Oh, wants to do that. Al, there is a question in the audience. Hold on one second, please. Oh, go, go ahead, yeah. You have to come up to the meeting. I mean, the mic. This thing, uh, I'm Phil Morowski. I'm on the board and with Mary Jane Samuel, who are representing Bracken. We're trying to get into getting a contractor to do this stuff. And so we sort of have to know how many curb stops they're gonna uh, have. Mm -hmm. Is there any number that you have? I think you need to talk to, to them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're That's like, all we need to know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll make a motion to adjourn as water commissioners. A second. Okay, roll call vote. Art? Aye. Amy? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Jared? Aye. And I'm an aye. There we go. Great.